Good morning and welcome to the lecture on Patient Assessment Chapter 8 in your text. After you complete this chapter, as well as the lecture material and any related coursework, you will understand the scope and sequence of patient assessment for medical and trauma patients and all the phases and components of patient assessment. You need to note that this chapter is divided into five sections, scene size up, primary assessment, history taking, secondary assessment, and reassessment. These divisions will help you in your understanding of the approach for teaching this skill as a whole concept. The National EMS Education Standard Competency states that the EMT will be able to apply scene information and patient assessment findings regarding scene size up, primary and secondary assessment, patient history, and reassessment to guide you in your management of the emergency patient. We'll talk about scene safety, scene management, and the impact that the environment has on patient care. We'll address hazards and violence, um, the need for additional or specialized resources, standard precautions, and multiple patient scenarios. For primary assessment, for all patient situations, we'll talk about level of consciousness, your ABCs. This is not related to CPR, this is related to assessment. We'll like, talk about identification of life threats, the assessment of vital functions, and your initial impression. Forming that initial impression is very important. We will discuss beginning interventions needed to preserve life and the integration of treatment procedures needed to preserve life. With history taking, you'll learn to determine chief complaint, to um, evaluate both either the mechanism of injury or the nature of the illness, or both, um, to look for associated signs and symptoms, to investigate the chief complaint, um, to evaluate past medical history and look for pertinent negatives. In the secondary assessment, we'll talk about performance of a rapid full body scan. Uh, we'll look at focused pain assessment, assessment of vital signs, and some techniques to do respiratory, uh, breath sounds, cardiovascular, neuro, musculoskeletal, and all the anatomic regions for physical exam. We'll talk about monitoring devices and their use as an EMT and how you can get information from these, but this does not um, necessarily mean you'll do it. It depends on agency protocol and local protocol, but pulse oximetry and the use of non-invasive blood, blood pressure techniques. And then the last piece is reassessment, talking about how and when to reassess and how and when to perform a reassessment in all patient situations. Okay, so back to our video lecture. The importance of patient assessment cannot be overemphasized to the EMT. You must be able to master and be comfortable with the patient assessment process, and the assessment is used to some degree in every patient that you will encounter. There are five main parts to patient assessment. We divide it up this way. The first is scene size up, then primary assessment, history taking, secondary assessment, and reassessment. Basically, while this is the parts, we determine the order based on how the patient is presented to us, what their um, initial presenting condition is. Rarely does one sign or symptom reveal to you the patient's status or underlying problem. You need to understand that a symptom is a subjective condition the patient feels and tells you about, and a sign is an objective condition you can observe about the patient. The patient assessment process is the ground on which all levels of EMT education are built and is the foundation for patient care. The first part, scene size up, is how you prepare for a specific situation. It begins with your basic dispatch information. It must be combined with an inspection of the scene that will help you ensure safety, identify hazards, safety concerns, and the number of patients you may have, and identify any additional resources you may need. As we go through these steps, the first is to ensure scene safety. The pre-hospital setting is not a controlled and isolated scene. It is unpredictable, dangerous, and unforgiving. Every scene in the pre-hospital environment does have a potential for injury. You need to ensure your own safety first and your patient's second. You need to do things like wearing, um, at a minimum, an American National Standards Institute ANSI 207 certified high visibility public safety vest. 
Okay, You need to look for possible dangers as you approach the scene and before you step out of the vehicle. Typically, the way you enter an area is also the way you will leave with your stretcher. You need to consider things like difficult terrain as part of what you're going to do when you're moving a stretcher across ground. You need to consider traffic safety issues and issues related to scene safety and vehicle rescue. You do not enter potentially dangerous scenes until a professional rescuer has made the scene safe. You need to also consider environmental conditions at the scene. Your patient may be outdoors, indoors, or in a public place, and you need to be aware of the weather and the physical terrain. Working in unfavorable conditions and on unstable surfaces is a large part of what we do in pre-hospital care, and a good rule for you to use is when faced with a wide variety of possibilities, any action you may take to protect yourself should also be considered for your patient as well as your crew. If appropriate, you can help protect bystanders from becoming patients as well. Some forms of hazards that we see are chemical and biologic, electricity from downed lines or lightning, water hazards, fires and explosions, and potentially toxic environments, as well as hazards are found at every motor vehicle collision scene. Information that may help you determine potential hazards can be provided to you by your dispatcher. Occasionally, you and your partner will not be able to enter a scene safely. If the scene is unsafe, the first step is to make it safe. If it is not possible for you to make it safe, then you should not enter. If the hazard presents a substantial risk to your health and safety, you should request the appropriate assistance. If the scene is a potential crime scene, follow your local protocol before entering. Beware of scenes with a potential for violence, such as patients who are violent, distraught family members, angry bystanders, gangs, and unruly crowds. The next step in patient assessment is determining your mechanism of injury or the nature of illness, or both. In order to care for patients who are trauma victims, you need to understand the MOI. With a traumatic injury, the body has been exposed to some force or energy that has resulted in a temporary injury, permanent damage, or even death. Fragile and easily injured areas include the brain, spinal cord, and the eyes. You can use the mechanism of injury as a guide to predict the potential for a serious injury by evaluating three things. The first is how much force was applied to the body. The second is how long was that force applied. And the third is what areas of the body were involved. With blunt trauma, the force of the injury occurs over a broad area and the skin is usually not broken. However, tissues and organs below that area of impact may also be damaged. With penetrating trauma, the force of the injury occurs at a small point of contact between the skin and the object causing injury. It is an open wound and has high potential for infection. How badly the injury is will depend upon the characteristics of the penetrating object, the amount of force or energy that was produced, and the part of the body that was affected. When we discuss medical patients for patient assessment, instead of mechanism of injury, we're going to look at the nature of their illness. There are some similarities here between MOI and NOI. Both of them require you to be an investigator and to research for clues regarding how the incident happened. To quickly determine nature of injury, you can talk with your patient, family, or bystanders. Then you will use your senses to check the scene for clues as to the possible problem. Be aware of scenes with more than one patient who are exhibiting similar signs or symptoms. This could indicate an unhealthy situation for you and your partner as well. Some of the examples of this include carbon monoxide poisoning. It could be an unhealthy situation for you, your partner, and family members of the patient or anyone else that's around. The importance of the mechanism of injury and nature of the illness. We need to consider MOI or NOI early, and that can be valuable in preparing to take care of our patients. During your assessment, you may be tempted to categorize your patient immediately as trauma or medical. Remember, the fundamentals of a good patient assessment are the same, despite whatever unique aspects of trauma and medical care there are. You need to take standard precautions. 
standard precautions and personal protective equipment need to be considered and adapted to the pre-hospital task at hand. PPE includes clothing or specialized equipment that provides protection to the wearer. The type of PPE will depend upon the specific job duties required during a patient care interaction. Standard precautions have been developed and these are protective measures that have traditionally um, been identified by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for use in dealing with objects, blood, body fluids, and other potential exposure um, risks for communicable diseases. The concept of standard precautions assumes that all blood, body fluids, non-intact skin, and mucous membranes may pose a substantial risk of infection. There is an exception for sweat at this time. At a minimum, you should wear gloves before you make patient contact. You should also consider glasses and a mask. Determining your number of patients. During this scene size up performance, it is important that you accurately identify how many patients you have to take care of. It is a critical factor in determining whether we need additional resources to assist us. When we have multiple patients, you need to use the incident command system, call for additional units, and then begin your triage. Incident command is a system implemented to manage disasters and mass casualty incidents in which section chiefs report to the commander. Triage is the process of sorting patients based on their severity of conditions, and we use the start triage system which categorizes patients as red, yellow, green, and black. You need to consider additional or specialized resources. Some situations may require more ambulances or other specialized resources. Some of these resources may include advanced life support if you're at a basic life support level, air medical support, fire departments who may handle high angle rescue, hazardous materials management, complex extrications from motor vehicle crashes, and water rescue as well as search and rescue teams. To determine if you require additional resources, ask yourself these questions. How many patients do I have? What is the nature of the patient's condition? Who called for EMS assistance and does the scene pose a threat to me, my patient, or others? The next step is primary assessment. Patient assessment begins when you actually greet your patient. And the goal of this step is to identify and initiate treatment of immediate or potential life threats. The patient's vital signs will determine the extent of your treatment at the scene. You need to form a general impression. This is formed to determine your care priorities. Some of the things we need to make note of are the patient's age, sex, race, level of distress, and overall appearance. As you approach, you want to make sure the patient sees you coming. You need to position yourself lower than the patient if at all possible, address them by their proper name, ask them about their chief complaint. You need to assess the patient's skin color and condition. Life-threatening problems found should be treated immediately. So if the patient's condition is stable, or stable but potentially unstable or unstable is a very big determining factor in where we go next. We want to assess the level of consciousness. The level of consciousness is part of our vital signs. It tells a lot about a patient's neurologic and physiologic statuses. The categories you may see, um, you need to determine what best fits the patient. Are they conscious and they're unaltered? Are they conscious with an altered LOC or are they unconscious? Patients who are conscious with an unaltered level of consciousness are considered stable. Patients with an altered level of consciousness, this may be due to adequate or inadequate perfusion. And perfusion is blood circulation within an organ or tissue. Some of the reasons patients may be experiencing altered level of consciousness besides a perfusion issue 
can be medications, drugs, alcohol, or other types of poisoning. Assessment of the unconscious patient focuses first on airway, breathing, and circulation, ABCs. A patient who has sustained unconsciousness should warn you that the patient may be experiencing a critical respiratory, circulatory, or CNS problem and they may have or they may have a deficit. You need to package this patient and provide rapid transport to a definitive care facility. Our ability to assess for responsiveness, we use the mnemonic AVPU and we choose one description. A stands for awake and alert. The patient is aware of you and is responsive to you and their environment. B, the other one is responsive to V, verbal stimuli. Patient's eyes open when you talk to them and he or she is able to respond in some meaningful way when you talk to them. Responsive to P, pain. The patient does not respond to your questions, but moves or cries out in response to some type of painful, noxious stimulus. U, unresponsive. The patient does not respond spontaneously or to a verbal or painful stimulus. They will probably have no cough or gag reflex as well. Some of the ways that we can test responsiveness of painful stimuli would be through pinching the earlobe, pressing down on the bone above the eye, or pinching the neck muscles. We historically used to do something called a sternal rub, but we have gotten away from that and used these types of techniques to determine painful stimulus. Some of the orientation tests that we use test mental status. We want to evaluate a person's ability to remember person, place, time, and event. The P for person, they can remember their name. Place identifies where they are right now. Time, current year, month, and approximate date. You can ask them if they know what day it is, what date it is, what month it is, what year it is. Those are all ways we can evaluate time. And then the event. Can you tell me what happened? They can either describe the events that happened or they can't. By doing this, it evaluates long-term memory, immediate-term memory, and shorter-term memory. If the patient knows these facts, the patient is said to be alert and fully oriented, alert and oriented to person, place, time, and event, or alert and oriented times four. Glasgow Coma Scale score can be helpful in providing additional information on patients who do have mental status changes. The GCS utilizes parameters that test a patient's eye opening, best verbal response, and best motor response. It provides a numeric score that defines the severity of a patient's brain dysfunction. And the eye-opening side of the scale correlates nicely to AVPU. They are alert, their eyes open spontaneously, they're verbal, they open in response to speech. P for pain, they open their eyes or do something in response to pain, or they do not have any eye opening. And then verbal and motor are also described here in the table, 8.1. The next thing to check is pupil reaction. The diameter and reactivity to light of the patient's pupils reflect the status of brain perfusion, oxygenation, and condition. The pupil is a circular opening in the center of the pigmented iris of the eye. They are normally round and approximately equal in size and serve as optical diaphragms, adjusting their size depending on available light. In the absence of any light, the pupils will become fully relaxed and dilated. And this gives a great demonstration of different pupil issues. Um, a small number of the population exhibits unequal pupils called anisocoria. You must assume the patient has depressed brain function as a result of CNS depression or injury if the pupils react in any of the following ways. Become fixed with no reaction to light. Dilate with introduction of a bright light and constrict when the light is removed. This is backward of what it should normally be. React sluggishly instead of briskly. Become unequal in size. Or become unequal in size when a bright light is introduced into or removed from one eye. Depressed brain function can be caused by the following situations. Injury of the brain or the brain stem. Trauma or stroke. Brain tumor inadequate oxygenation or perfusion, as well as certain drugs or toxins that are CNS system depressants. 
We use the mnemonic PEARL as an assessment guide, and just backing up very quickly, opiates, which are one category of CNS depressants, cause the pupils to constrict so significantly, regardless of light, they become so small, we describe those as pinpoint pupils, and that is a classic sign of a narcotics issue. PEARL is our assessment guide, and we use this. This stands for pupils equal and round, regular in size, and react to light, P-E-A-R-R-L. The next step is airway assessment. As you move through your primary assessment, you need to always be alert for signs of airway obstruction. To prevent permanent damage to the brain, heart, and lungs, or even death, you must determine if the airway is open or patent and adequate. In responsive patients, patients of any age who are talking or crying or have an open airway fit this category. You need to watch and listen to how they speak. This may provide important clues about adequacy of their airway and the status of their breathing. If you are able to identify an airway problem, stop the assessment process and make the airway patent. In an unresponsive patient, we need to realize that immediate assessment of the airway patency is important, as well as any patient who has a decreased level of consciousness, a decreased LOC. If there is a potential for trauma, use the modified jaw thrust technique to open the airway. If it can be confirmed that the patient did not experience a traumatic event, you can use the head tilt chin lift technique to open and maintain a patent airway. One of the major causes of airway obstruction in an unconscious adult patient can be relaxation of the tongue muscles, which allows the tongue to fall to the back of the throat. The head tilt chin lift will adequately manage this problem. Some of the signs of obstruction we see in an unconscious patient include obvious trauma, blood, or other obstruction, noisy breathing, such as snoring, bubbling, gurgling, crowing, or other abnormal sounds, extremely shallow or absent breathing is another one of these things that give us a clue that airway is having issues. Remember, airway positioning depends on the age and size of your patient. Adults lead, need a little more assistance with opening the airway. Infants and children need very little manual maneuvers, but they do need some. B, assess for breathing. Once you have made sure that the patient's airway is open and patent, make sure that their breathing is present and adequate. A patient who can breathe without assistance is said to have spontaneous respirations or spontaneous breathing. Breathing is a continuous process in which each breath regularly follows the last with no notable interruption. You assess this by watching the patient's chest rise and fall, feeling for air through the mouth and nose during exhalation, and listening to breath sounds with a stethoscope over each lung. You should get in the habit of listening to lung sounds on every patient you encounter. When we assess breathing, the things we are looking for follow. The rate. How many times do they inhale and exhale in one minute? The rhythm. Is it a normal rhythm of inhalation and exhalation, or is it irregular? Is it regular or irregular? And the quality or character of breathing. And then the depth. How deeply are they breathing? Ask yourself the following questions. Does my patient appear to be choking? Is the rate too fast or too slow? Are the respirations shallow or deep? Is the patient cyanotic or blue? Am I hearing abnormal sounds when I listen to the lungs? Does my patient move air into and out of the lungs on both sides? All important questions for your patient. We'll watch this animation one more time. Air in, chest expansion, air out, chest relaxation. We need to administer supplemental oxygen if respirations are too fast, generally more than 20 breaths a minute, but not always. Respirations are too shallow. Respirations are too slow, generally fewer than 12, but not always. We can consider 
providing our patients with positive pressure ventilations with an airway adjunct when their rate is greater than 24 or less than 8. Realistically, a lot of times we look for the 10-30 rule, which is less than 10 or more than 30. We may need to intervene with positive pressure ventilation with a bag valve mask. In an adult patient, realize children and infants breathe differently. A normal respiratory rate varies widely in adults, but it does generally range from 12 to 20 breaths a minute. Remember that people who are physically fit may breathe at less than 12 times a minute normally. People with issues like chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases may breathe more than 20. This may be normal for them. Children generally breathe even faster. And how we count respiratory rate is we count the number of breaths in a 30 second period and multiply by two. Many times healthcare providers will use 15. However, if you are inexperienced in this technique, it is better if you do 30 seconds and then multiply it by two. This gives you number of breaths per minute. While you are counting respirations, you should also note the rhythm. If the time from one peak chest rise to the next is fairly consistent, then they are considered regular. If respirations vary or change frequently, we consider that irregular. Here is a great um, table in your book to keep up with. Generally speaking, adults and adolescents 12 to 20, average normal range, children 1 to 12, 15 to 30, and infants can breathe up to 50 or 60 times a minute. Quality of breathing. It may be helpful to listen to breath sounds on each side of your patient's chest early during your primary assessment. Decreased or absent breath sounds on one side of the chest and decreased movement in the rise and fall on one side indicate inadequacy in breathing. Normal breathing is silent or in a very quiet environment accompanied only by the sounds of air movement at the mouth and nose. You can always hear a patient's breath sounds better from their back instead of their front. One thing to remember is any patient who is coughing up thick yellowish or greenish sputum, which is matter from the lungs, most likely has some type of advanced respiratory infection. This is a great picture of listening to lung sounds in placement of the stethoscope. Again, much easier to hear from the back than the front, while we do realize sometimes we can't assess the back. So what are we listening for? We want to aus auscultate, listen, over the upper lungs, the apices, the lower lungs, the bases, and the major airways, mid-clavicular and mid-axillary. We want to lift the clothing or slide the stethoscope under the clothing, place the diaphragm of the scope firmly against the skin to hear the breath sounds, and we're listening for normal breath sounds, clear and quiet during inspiration and expiration, wheezing breath sounds, these suggest an obstruction of the lower airways, rouse, a moist crackling, usually on both inspiration and expiration. Ronchi, low-pitched, noisy sounds that are most prominent on expiration. And strider, a brassy crowing sound that is most prominent on inspiration. Breathing depth. The amount of air that the patient is exchanging depends on the rate and their tidal volume. Some of the things that we may see here um, with respiratory issues, when we're looking at tidal volume, we need to understand that it is a measure of the depth of breathing and is the amount of air in milliliters that is moved into or out of the lungs during one inhalation. Shallow respirations can be identified by little movement to the chest wall, which is a reduced tidal volume or poor chest excursion. Deep respirations, you will see significant rise and fall of the chest. The presence of retractions, which is an indentation above the clavicles and in the spaces between the ribs, or the use of accessory muscles of respiration is a sign of inadequate breathing. Nasal flaring and seesaw breathing in pediatric patients indicates inadequate respiratory effort. If your patient can speak only two or three words without pausing to take a breath, this is a condition known as two to three word dyspnea. They have a serious breathing problem. Normal breathing is an effortless process that does not affect speech, posture, or positioning. If a patient is tripoding, they are sitting in the tripod position. They are sitting upright and leaning forward on outstretched arms with the head and chin being thrust slightly forward. This causes them some relief in breathing, and this is a significant conscious effort required for them to breathe. Okay. 
Breathing that becomes progressively more difficult requires progressively more effort. This is known as labored breathing. The sniffing position, the patient sits upright with head and chin thrust slightly forward and they appear to be actually sniffing. The next step is to assess circulation. Realize we do all this in a matter of seconds. It takes more time to talk about it than it does to actually perform the skill. Circulation is evaluated by assessing pulse rate, pulse quality, and pulse rhythm, just like with breathing. We want to assess the pulse. Often referred to as a heartbeat, the pulse is the pressure wave that occurs as each heartbeat causes a surge of blood circulating through the arteries. The other, thing, other things besides rate, quality, and rhythm we look at are identification of external bleeding, evaluation of skin, color, temperature, and moisture. To determine if the pulse is present, you will need to palpate or feel it. Patients who are responsive that are older than a year, we generally palpate the radial pulse at the wrist. Unresponsive patients, you should always palpate the carotid pulse at the neck. Anyone under one year of age, we should palpate the brachial pulse, which is located at the inside part of the upper arm, any children under a year old. If you cannot palpate a pulse in an unresponsive patient, you need to begin the steps of CPR. These are normal ranges for pulse rate. Again, adults and adolescents 60 to 100, younger children and infants much faster. For an adult, the normal resting pulse rate should be between 60 and 100 and could be as much as 100 in geriatric patients. In pediatric patients, the younger they are, the faster the rate. For most patients, when you're obtaining a pulse rate, you should count the number of pulses felt in 30 seconds and multiply by 2. It is important to remember that an experienced EMT can do the 15 second technique, however, 30 seconds is far more accurate. Anything greater than 100 beats a minute, we describe that as tachycardic, and anything less than 60, we describe that as bradycardic. If the pulse feels of normal strength, we describe it as being strong. If it's stronger than normal strength, we describe that as bounding, and if it's weaker, we describe that as weaker threading. We need to determine whether the, whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. When the interval between each contraction of the heart is short, the pulse is rapid. When the interval is longer, the pulse is slower. It should be easy to feel, and weak pulses may give us an indication of a problem. Assess the skin. A normally functioning circulatory system perfuses the skin with oxygenated blood. You need to evaluate skin color, temperature, and condition as well as capillary refill. Skin color is determined by the blood circulating through vessels and the amount and type of pigment that is present in the skin. Patients who may be experiencing poor peripheral circulation, this may cause the skin to appear pale, white, ashen, or gray. If the blood is not properly saturated with oxygen, it may appear blue. Changes in skin color may also result from a chronic illness. It's very important to realize that. You see this picture of this infant with cyanosis around the lips and the eyes. Skin can also appear red or flushed, and that's because of high blood pressure or higher temperatures. The skin temperature. Normal skin will be warm to the touch, 98.6 average. Abnormal or hot, cool, cold, and clammy. Dry skin is normal. Skin that is wet or moist, often called diaphoretic, or excessively hot and dry suggests a problem in the circulatory system. We evaluate capillary refill in order to assess the ability of the circulatory system to restore blood to the capillaries. We do this by placing your thumb on the patient's fingernail with your fingers on the underside of the patient's finger and gently comp compress. You remove the pressure and as the underlying capillaries refill with blood, the nail bud will restore from white to its normal pink color. If perfusion is adequate, the color in the nail bed should be restored to its normal pink color within two seconds. This is an example of cap refill. You see the white blanching and then the return to pink. Assess and control external bleeding. We do this after clearing the airway and stabilizing breathing. Bleeding from a large vein is characterized by a steady flow. Bleeding from an artery is characterized by a spurting flow. 
Very quickly, you should run gloved hands from the patient's head to toe, pausing periodically to see if your gloves are bloody. If we find external bleeding, control is very simple. First of all, apply direct pressure. If they're bleeding on the arms or legs, we can elevate. When direct pressure and elevation are not successful, we immediately apply a tourniquet. Identify and treat life threats. The EMT must determine a life threat and quickly address it. There will be a loss of meaningful communication between you and the patient. After a variable period, this loss of consciousness will occur. Jaw muscles will then become slack, leading to airway obstruction, and the patient may stop breathing. The heart cannot function without oxygen, and it will stop. Brain cells become damaged, leading to irreversible brain damage. Life-saving interventions begin with opening the airway. Perform a rapid scan. Scan the patient's body to identify injuries that must be managed or protected immediately. This takes about 60 to 90 seconds, and it is not a focused physical exam on your patient. This will come later. There is a skill drill for this, and I will attach both the skill video with the skill PowerPoint you can go through and the check sheet. The rapid scan assists us in determining transport priority. Our high priority patients include any of the following. Difficulty breathing, poor general impression, unresponsive with no gag or cough reflex, severe pain in the chest, pale skin or other signs of poor perfusion, complicated childbirth, uncontrolled bleeding, responsive but cannot follow commands, severe pain in any part of the body, or inability to move any part of the body. These are all priority patients. The rapid scan assists in determining this priority. The golden period is the time from injury to definitive care during which treatment of shock and traumatic injury should occur because surviving, survival potential is best. We aim to assess, stabilize, package, and start transport to the appropriate facility within 10 minutes. We often refer to this as the platinum 10. Transport decisions should be made at this point. Sometimes patients will benefit from immediate transport while others are better served on scene. We base these decisions on their condition, the availability of advanced care, distance to the receiving facility, and our local protocols. We have to realize that that platinum 10 minutes, we only have a golden period or a golden hour. It sometimes takes up to 20 minutes or longer for the incident to be discovered and EMS to be activated. And then we have 10 minutes from the time we get on scene to assess, intervene, and package. And then we have 30 minutes to get the patient to a hospital and get them initially stabilized in the hospital ER. As I said, these are the reasons we make to determine um, transport priority. History taking. History taking provides detail about the patient's chief complaint and an account of the patient's signs and symptoms. Be sure to document the following. Date of the incident, all times of assessments and interventions, the patient's age, sex, and race, their past medical history, and their current health status. Investigate the chief complaint, history of present illness. Make introductions to your patient, make the patient feel comfortable, and get your permission to treat. Ask a few simple open-ended questions. Refer to the patient as Mr., Ms., or Mrs. using their proper name, last name. Use eye contact, body position, and language to show you care and encourage the patient to speak. If your patient is not responsive, information may be available at the scene to give you clues. You can get this from family members present, anyone who has witnessed the situation, or medical alert jewelry. We use the sample history mnemonic to obtain the, our history information. S stands for signs and symptoms. A for allergies, M for medications, P for pertinent past medical history, L for last oral intake, and E for events leading up to. We use the OPQ RST to assess for pain. When did the problem start? And what caused it? That's onset. P for provocation or palliation. Does anything make it better or worse? 
Q for quality, what's it like, sharp or dull, R for region or radiation, where does it hurt, does it move anywhere, S for severity, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the, f the worst pain you've ever had in your life, what number would you give it? T for timing, has it been constant or does it come and go? We need to document all pertinent negatives. A pertinent negatives are findings that are negative that warrant no care or intervention. For example, if a patient has chest pain, do they also have difficulty breathing? It's very common. If they don't, that's a pertinent negative. Get history on sensitive topics. This is a little tricky. We need to ask about alcohol and drug use. Some of the signs may be confusing, hidden, or disguised, and their history may be unreliable if they're using alcohol and drugs. Many patients deny having any problems. Do not judge and be professional in your approach. Physical abuse or violence. Report. Realize that in Montana it is not mandatory reporting and that if someone is a victim of domestic abuse and they do not want you to report. By doing so, you could cause them further harm. Again, follow your local protocols. Do not accuse. Immediately involve law enforcement. Sexual history. You need to consider that all female patients of childbearing age who report lower abdominal pain are pregnant unless it's ruled out by history or other information. We need to ask the tough questions. We need to ask about when was your last menstrual period? Are your periods normal? Do you have urinary frequency or burning? What is the severity of cramping and are there any foul odors? Is there a possibility you may be pregnant? Are you taking birth control? How many sexual partners do you have? Inquire about urinary symptoms with male patients. Is there any pain associated with urination? Do you have any discharge, sores, or an increase in urination? Do you have burning or difficulty voiding? Has there been any trauma? Have you had recent sexual encounters? Ask about the potential for STDs in all patients. Special challenges in getting history include silence. Being patient is extremely important for our patients because they are in a crisis and they need our help. We need to use a closed-ended question that requires a simple yes or no answer may get the conversation started. Consider whether the silence is a clue in the patient's chief complaint. Patients who talk too much. Sometimes getting the details about a medical condition can be difficult if the patient talks around your question or if you have a difficult time refocusing their conversations. Some of the reasons this may occur include excessive caffeine, nervousness, ingestion of cocaine, crack, or methamphetamines. Multiple patient symptoms. In the geriatric population, this is a very common feature. We need to prioritize complaints as we would in triage. Start with the most serious and end with the least. Anxiety. Frequently, patients who are anxious can be observed at emergency scenes, and that may involve a large number of patients, such as during a disaster. They can experience signs of psychological shock, such as pallor, being pale, diaphoresis, their skin being very sweaty, being short of breath, numbness in their hands or feet, dizziness or lightheadedness, or even a loss of consciousness. Anger and hostility. Emergency calls have a high potential for unexpected violence because friends, family, or bystanders may direct their anger and rage at you. You need to remain calm, reassuring, and gentle. If you feel the scene is not safe or secured, get it secured or get out intoxication. Do not put an intoxicated patient in a position where he or she feels threatened and has no way out. Potential for violence and a physical confrontation is high when a patient is intoxicated. Alcohol dulls the patient's senses, which will make it difficult for an intoxicated patient to inform you that something feels painful. Crying. A patient who cries may be sad, in pain, or overwhelmed emotionally. You should remain calm and be patient, reassuring and confident, and maintain a soft, steady voice. Depression. Depression is among the leading causes of disability worldwide. Some of the symptoms include sadness, a feeling of hopelessness, restlessness, irritability, sleeping and eating disorders, and decreased energy. The most effective treatment in handling a patient's depression is being a good listener. Confusing behavior or history. Conditions such as hypoxia, stroke, diabetes, trauma, medication use, and other drug use can alter a patient's explanation of events. Geriatric patients, it's not uncommon that we see someone with dementia, delirium, 
or Alzheimer's disease. If your patient has limited cognitive abilities, we consider them developmentally handicapped or disabled. You need to keep your questions simple and limit the use of medical terms. You need to also rely on the presence of family, caregivers, and friends to answer your questions if the patient is severely limited with their cognitive function. Language barriers. Find an interpreter if possible. If it's not, determine whether the patient understands who you are. Keep your questions straightforward and brief and use hand gestures. Be aware of language diversity within your community. Know what the, what the languages are that are out there. Hearing. We talked about this in the last lecture. Ask questions slowly and clearly. Use a stethoscope to function as a hearing aid for the patient if needed. Learn some simple sign language techniques during your career and that will help you in the communication process and always have a pencil and paper at the ready. Visual impairments. Identify yourself verbally when entering the scene. It is important that you put any items that have been moved back into their previous position. During the assessment and history taking process, explain to the patient everything you were doing. Secondary assessment. The secondary is performed at the scene or in the back of the ambulance en route to the hospital, or not at all. Sometimes we just do not have the time in caring for a critical patient to perform a secondary. You may have to continue to manage life threats during your primary assessment while you're en route to the hospital. The purpose is to perform a systematic physical exam of your patient. This physical exam can be a systematic head to toe, a full body scan, or a systematic assessment that focuses on certain regions of the body often determined by getting the chief complaint. Some of the guidelines on how and what to assess during a physical exam. You need to inspect. You look at the patient for abnormalities. You need to palpate, which is touch or feel the patient for abnormalities. You cannot properly assess a patient without putting your hands on them. You need to auscultate or listen using a stethoscope. The mnemonic that reminds you what to look for in patient assessment is called DCAP BTLS. D stands for deformities. C for contusions, A for abrasions, P for punctures and penetrations, B for burns, T for tenderness, L for lacerations, and S for swelling. Always compare findings on the right and the left side of the body if at all possible. Assess vital signs. These devices should never be used to replace your comprehensive hands-on assessment of your patient. They are tools, they are adjuncts, and help us in our job. Pulse oximetry is a newer assessment tool to evaluate oxygenation. It measures oxygenation or oxygen saturation of hemoglobin in the capillary beds. There is a sensing probe and you place it on the finger or the earlobe and in most patients the reading should fall between 95 and 100 percent. Any patient with difficulty breathing should receive oxygen regardless of what their oximetry value is. We should never withhold oxygen. Non-invasive blood pressure measurement. The sphygmo manometer or blood pressure cuff is used to measure blood pressure. Oscillometric measurement or electronic measurement is another method of obtaining blood pressure readings. The initial assessment of a patient is conducted to quickly identify any life-threatening conditions. Although some of these conditions may not be readily apparent, they will be reflected by changes in respiratory, circulatory, and central nervous system. By obtaining a patient's vital signs, you often can detect a developing life-threatening situation and provide treatment to prevent serious complications. Use appropriate body substance isolation precautions prior to beginning patient care. Using the first two fingers, palpate and count the rate of the radial pulse at the wrist. Describe the quality of the pulse, whether it's strong, weak, thready, and the regularity of the rhythm. Interpret the findings. Count the rate of the patient's respirations and describe the quality. Is it shallow or labored? Assess the regularity of the respiratory pattern. Interpret the findings. To palpate systolic blood pressure, apply the blood pressure cuff snugly to the upper arm. Be aware that choosing the proper blood pressure cuff for the patient is an important part of obtaining accurate blood pressure. Most cuffs have markings to identify the correct size. 
When the cuff is placed around the patient's arm, the arrow or other marking should fit between the minimum and maximum size indicators. Locate the radial pulse using two fingers. Keep the fingers in place throughout this procedure. Gently inflate the cuff, feeling for the disappearance of the palpable pulse. After the pulse disappears, give the bulb one or two more squeezes. Carefully and slowly release the air from the blood pressure cuff. Palpate for the return of the pulse. This is the palpated systolic pressure. Deflate the cuff completely when finished and prior to reinflation if subsequent attempts are performed. To auscultate blood pressure, apply the cuff snugly to the upper arm. Place the diaphragm of the stethoscope over the brachial artery. Inflate the cuff gently, listening for the Karatkov sound to appear as the pressure increases. After the sounds disappear, give the bulb one or two more squeezes. Carefully and slowly release the air from the blood pressure cuff. Listen for the return and disappearance of the Karatkov sounds. The return of the Karatkov sounds gives the systolic blood pressure while the disappearance gives a diastolic. Deflate the cuff completely when finished and prior to reinflation if additional attempts are performed. Interpret the findings. This video is a great example of how to take vital signs. It gives you some visual knowledge to help you during the lab setting. In title, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the byproduct of aerobic cellular metabolism and it reflects the amount of oxygen being consumed during this process. Capnography is a non-invasive method that can quickly and efficiently provide information on your patient's ventilatory status, circulation, and metabolism. End tidal CO2 is the partial pressure or maximal concentration of CO2 at the end of the exhaled breath and the normal range is from 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury or 5 to 6 percent CO2. Colorimetric devices provide continuous end tidal monitoring. Capnography and capnometry provide a digital reading and waveform. The next step is a systematic head-to-toe exam. Our goal is to identify injuries, or causes missed during the primary assessment 60 to 90 second rapid scan. There is a skill drill for this as well. I will post the PowerPoint for you as well as the check sheet to perform a full body scan on a patient who has no spinal cord injuries. Focused assessment. This is a systematic assessment as well focusing on specific things found in our chief complaint investigation. We perform these on patients who have non-significant mechanism of injury or on responsive medical patients. This type is based on our chief complaint. And our goal of the focused assessment is to focus attention on the immediate problem. For example, in the respiratory system, we want to expose the patient's chest, look again for signs of airway obstruction, as well as trauma to the neck or chest, inspect the chest for overall symmetry, are both sides the same or not, Listen carefully to breath sounds, noting any abnormalities. Measure the rate. Observe for chest rise and fall for tidal volume and effort of respirations. Watch for signs of abnormal breathing, such as retractions. Carefully reevaluate pulse rate, skin color, temperature, and condition, and blood pressure. And inspect and palpate from the clavicles to the shoulder to the abdomen and reassess lung sounds. Cardiovascular system. Look for trauma to the chest and listen for breath sounds. Reevaluate the pulse and respiratory rate and the blood pressure. Pay particular attention to rate, quality, and rhythm. Reevaluate skin color, temperature, and condition. Check and compare distal pulses to determine any right and left sided differences. Consider auscultation for abnormal heart sounds. Blood pressure. Blood pressure is the pressure of circulating blood against the walls of the arteries. 
a drop in blood pressure indicates a loss of blood, a loss of vascular tone, or a cardiac pump problem. Decreased blood pressure is a late sign of shock and indicates the critical decompensated shock phase has begun. Abnormally high blood pressure may result in a rupture or other critical damage to the arterial system. Systolic pressure is the increased pressure that is caused along the artery with each contraction or systole of the ventricles and the pulse wave that it produces. Diastolic pressure is a residual pressure that remains in the arteries during the relaxation phase of the heart cycle, diastole, when the left ventricle is at rest. A blood pressure cuff contains the following components, a wide outer cuff, an inflatable wide bladder sewn into a portion of the cuff, a ball pump with a one-way valve, a pressure gauge calibrated in millimeters of mercury. In Skill Drill 3, I will post both the PowerPoint slides and this skill drill, and in class on Monday night, you guys will actually be taking blood pressures. The palpation feeling method does not depend on your ability to hear sounds and should be used in certain cases to obtain a patient's blood pressure. It is important that you realize that in the back of an ambulance, hearing a blood pressure by auscultation is a very difficult skill and takes practice and time. Normal blood pressure um, ranges for patients systolic are shown here. Hypotension is when we have a blood pressure that's lower than normal and hypertension is when the blood pressure is higher than normal. Neurologic exam. A neurologic assessment should be performed any time you are confronted with a patient who has mental status changes, evidence of a possible head injury, or stuporous, or dizzy, drowsy, or have experienced syncope or near syncope. A neurologic assessment can be as simple as talking with your patient, asking questions, and receiving an appropriate reply. We want to evaluate level of consciousness and orientation to determine the patient's ability to think. We can use the AVPU scale if that is appropriate and determine mental status. When evaluating speech, assess their thought processes and determine if the patient may be delusional or has unusual reasoning. Inspect the head for signs of trauma. Check your patient for bilateral muscle strength and weakness. Test for pain, sensations, and position, and compare distal and proximal motor and sensory responses in one side with the other. Musculoskeletal assessment. Assess for posture if standing. Look at joints. Check for range of motion. Always compare the right side with the left. Look for weakness or atrophy and assess equality of grip strength. Look for trauma to the abdomen and for distension. Palpate the abdomen for tendus, tenderness, rigidity, and patient guarding. Inspect the pelvis for symmetry and any obvious signs of injury, bleeding, or deformity. If you feel any movement or crepitus or if the patient reports pain or tenderness, severe injury may be present. Extremities. Ex inspect each extremity for symmetry, cuts, bruises, swelling, obvious injuries, and bleeding. Palpate along the extremity for deformity. Check pulse, motor function, and sensory function in each extremity. Posterior body. Inspect the back for tenderness, deformity, deformity, symmetry, and open wounds. Carefully palpate the spine from the neck to the pelvis for tenderness and deformity. Anatomic regions. Head, neck, and cervical spine. You're going to palpate the scalp and the skull. Very gently, you're looking for pain, deformity, tenderness, crepitus, and bleeding. Check the patient's eyes, assess pupillary function, shape, and response. Check the color of the sclera, the white part of the eye. Assess the patient's cheekbones or zygomas for possible injury. Check the patient's ears and nose for fluid. Check the upper maxilla and lower mandible of the jaw. Open the patient's mouth, looking for any broken or missing teeth. Note any unusual odors that may be present in the mouth. Palpate the neck. For signs of trauma, such as deformities, bumps, swelling, bruising, and bleeding, as well as a crackling sound produced by air bubbles under the skin, which is what is known as subcutaneous emphysema. Moving down to the chest. When assessing the chest, inspect, visualize, and palpate over the chest area for injury and signs of trauma, including bruising, tenderness, and swelling. When assessing breathing, watch for both sides of the chest to rise and fall together with normal breathing. 
observe for abnormal breathing sounds, including retractions or paradoxical motion. Abdomen. Inspect and palpate the abdomen for any obvious injuries, bruising, or bleeding. Be sure to palpate the front and the back, evaluating for symmetry, masses, tenderness, and bleeding. The abdomen is broken into four quadrants, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, right upper quadrant, and right lower quadrant. Assess for the presence of rebound tenderness. Reassessment. Perform a reassessment at regular intervals during your assessment process. The purpose of this reassessment is to identify and treat changes in the patient's condition. We perform reassessment by first of all repeating the primary assessment, looking for ABCs and life threats. Then we're going to reassess vital signs. We want to compare our first set or our baseline vitals uh, with any and all subsequent vital signs. We want to look for trending, changes. We want to reassess mental status and ABCs and monitor skin color and temperature. This is a very early sign of changes in your patient's status. Reassess the chief complaint. The purpose is to ask and answer the following questions about the patient's chief complaint. Is the current treatment improving the patient's condition? Has an already identified problem gotten better? Has an already identified problem gotten worse? And what is the nature of any newly identified problems we have found? The next step, we're going to recheck our interventions. Anything that we've done, we need to reevaluate. Obviously, most important are our ABCs. We want to always ensure management of bleeding and ensure adequacy of other interventions and consider the need for new interventions. Identify and treat changes in the patient's condition. If the changes in the patient's condition are improved, simply continue whatever treatment you are providing. If the patient's condition deteriorates, prepare to modify treatments as appropriate. Document any changes, whether they're negative or positive. And in reassessment, if your patient is unstable, it will occur every five minutes and we may only do ABCs. A patient who is stable should be reassessed every 15 minutes. In summary of this chapter, the assessment process begins with your scene size up and that identifies real or potential hazards. Your patient should not be approached until these hazards have been dealt with in a way that eliminates or minimizes risk to the EMTs and patients. The primary assessment is performed on all patients. It includes forming an initial general impression, including the level of consciousness, and identifies any life-threatening conditions to the ABCs. A rapid scan is performed to assist in prioritizing time and mode of transport. Any life threats identified must be treated before moving on to the next step. ABCs are assessed to evaluate the patient's general condition. History taking includes an investigation of the patient's chief complaint or history of their present illness. A sample history is generally taken during the step of the assessment process. This information may be obtained from the patient, family, friends, or bystanders. By asking several important questions, you will be able to determine the patient's signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, pertinent past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up to the incident. The secondary assessment is a systematic physical exam of the patient. The physical exam may be systematic head to toe, full body scan, or a systematic assessment that focuses on a certain area or region of the body and it is often determined by the chief complaint. Circumstances will dictate which aspects of the physical exam will be used. The secondary assessment is performed on scene or can be performed in the back of the ambulance while en route to the hospital. There are going to be times when you may not have time to perform a secondary assessment at all if the patient has serious life threats. Reassessment is performed on all patients. It gives you an opportunity to reevaluate their chief complaint and to reassess interventions, modifying treatment as appropriate. A patient who is in stable condition should be reassessed every 15 minutes, and an unstable patient should be reassessed every five. The assessment process is systematic and dynamic. It means it's ever-changing. Each assessment will be slightly different depending on the needs of your patient. This result will be the process that will enable you to quickly identify and treat needs of all your patients, both medical and trauma, in a way that meets their unique needs. Thank you for listening. I hope this has been helpful to you. There will be, as I said, after this, you will find PowerPoints for each skill drill. 
you will find the skill drill sheet. And I do have three YouTube videos that detail an introduction to physical assessment for both the medical and trauma patient. Thank you.